Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to six player game, Evolution by North Star Games. The world is a harsh place with many species fighting for survival. So yours are going to need to adapt in order to feed on the limited natural plant life or on the species of other players. You'll need to evolve wisely or go extinct. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the watering hole in the center of the table and the food tokens nearby in a pile known as the food bank. Then shuffle and place the deck of trait cards face down the table. If you're playing with two players, first remove 40 random traits from the deck and return them to the box. I'm going to set up a three player game, so I'll keep these in the deck. Nearby, also put out the species boards and these wooden cubes. Each player should now take a token bag and a player aid pamphlet. Then randomly determine a first player and give them the first player marker. And that's the setup. Now for the purposes of this video, I am going to make a couple of small adjustments. First of all, these player aids are fantastic when you're first learning the game. They give you a quick overview of the rules and they also show you all of the different traits you're gonna find in the trait deck. But I'm not gonna need these during this video, so I'm just going to put them aside. I'm also going to remove about half of the species boards. You generally won't need all of them unless you have more players. And to help keep things organized on the table, I've turned the food bank into a food bowl. And I also have a glass jar here for the extra markers. And that's just going to help me keep things organized on the table as I move things around. Evolution is a game where players are going to be developing and guiding their species so that they can eat as much food as possible. Every food token that you collect is going to give you a point. And at the end of the game, if you have any species that are surviving, you will also gain additional points. The game is played over a series of rounds and each round is broken into four phases, starting with the deal cards phase. Each species is represented by its own board. And at the beginning of this phase, if you don't have a species, you're dealt one for free. So at the beginning of the game, we'll give one to each of the players. You'll also notice these are double-sided to allow you to orient them however you like, but otherwise they're used to track the exact same information. A new species also starts with wooden markers in the lowest position of the body size and population tracks. When you first get a species, it's very basic. It has no notable traits, but you'll have a chance to change that later. Now in this phase, each player is dealt three trait cards plus one extra for each species they control. So in the first round, all players will get four cards. Now you move on to the second phase, selecting food. Here, players will secretly choose one trait in their hand to put face down on the watering hole. This can be done in any order since the information is going to remain hidden, at least for now. Collectively, these traits are going to determine how much additional food is added or taken away, in some cases, from the watering hole. This is based solely on the value found here in the bottom right-hand corner of your trait. So that's primarily what you'll be focusing on when you make your selection. Also keep in mind, any trait that you place in the watering hole is one that you will not be able to use later in the round. So that could also factor into your decision-making process. Now it's time to move on to the play cards phase. You'll start with the first player and they'll be able to play as many cards as they want to or are able from their hand. Then the next player in clockwise order will do the same and so it goes. Each player will have one opportunity to do this during this phase. If you have six players, they recommend you use the quick play variant. And in that situation, all the players just play their cards at once, you don't wait to take your turns. And that just speeds things up a little bit if that's something that you're concerned about. When it's your turn to play cards, you're going to have three different actions that you can take. And you can take them in any order and you can repeat them as often as you want to or are able. The first option you have is to place a trait from your hand into the discard pile, which should be beside the draw deck. For each trait that you get rid of in this way, you can then increase either the body size or population value of one of your species by one. Simply move one of the markers up on the track. So when you move up on the population track, it represents you putting more of your species out into the world. Basically, they're having lots of babies. And that can be good, because the more that you have to eat, 
the more food tokens you can collect. But the more you have to eat, the more susceptible you are to starvation. So you have to be careful of that. When you go up on the body size track, it represents each individual member of that species gaining larger and, and bigger physical attributes, which can be great if you're trying to build a predator or if you're trying to defend yourself against predators. Either way, you can never increase these markers beyond the sixth position on the board. Another option you have is to discard a trait in order to start a new species by collecting a new species board and then placing markers again in the lowest positions of the body size and population track. There is no limit to how many species you can have at a time, but when placing, you must always put new species either to the right or left of your current group of boards. You can never put them in between two other species. This is important because some of the traits you'll assign to your animals will have arrows in the top left or right hand corners, and this means that their abilities will affect the animals that they're adjacent to. Speaking of which, the third option you have is to assign traits from your hand to your species, and these go face down at first. They will be revealed later, but this way your opponents don't initially know what you're planning. I'm going to flip this one over for now so I can better explain the rules around the traits. Essentially, you're giving your animals abilities that will aid them in surviving. For example, this species now has a long neck, and the benefit of that is listed right here. A single species may never have more than three traits, and in a two-player game, they may never have more than two traits. You also can't duplicate traits within a single species, so I couldn't give this one another long neck. But I could add it to this other species that I control because it's separate. Also, any time during this phase, you can choose to discard one or more traits from any of your species. This is especially useful if your species is already at its maximum of traits and you want to add a new one. Remember, traits are initially played face down, but once all players have completed the play cards phase, all assigned traits are flipped face up. In your first games, it's a nice idea to have the players share out loud the traits that they have assigned to their species. In this video, we will not go over the individual traits that each species can attain, but don't forget they're all explained directly on the cards and in the player reference sheet that each player will have access to. The final phase of the round is feeding. The first player will reveal the trait cards that were put on the watering hole and then add food tokens from the bank to the pond equal to the numbers that are found here. You'll notice some values are negative, and that means it's possible to have an overall negative total. In that case, you will remove that number of food tokens from the watering hole. That might have existed from a previous round. If you run out of tokens to remove, just ignore any extra amount. In this case, however, we have a positive total. Eight, take away two, for six. We'll take that number of tokens from the food bank and add it to the watering hole. You'll notice these are double-sided. One side shows meat, the other shows plant, and they should go into the watering hole plant side up. As a shortcut, you can skip flipping the tokens now and instead just flip them to the correct side when taking them. You then discard the trait cards that were used to collect this food. Any players who have traits on their species with this greenish gray border will have effects that trigger now. And players don't have to take turns doing this, as the effects won't interfere with the other opponents. But if you have multiple green bordered effects, then you can decide the order in which to resolve them within your own species. Long Neck says that when the food cards are revealed, take one plant food from the food bank. And so we'll do that now. And food tokens are always added to the bottommost empty space on this track here. A species is said to be hungry until it has as many food tokens as its total population. So this animal will no longer be hungry once it has a token in this space. An animal that is full can't eat anymore. Once all of those greenish traits have been resolved, you will then go back to the first player, and they will choose one of their hungry species to feed. Our first player has two species, but they're choosing to feed this one first. And after choosing to feed an animal, you take one plant food from the watering hole and add it to the lowest empty space on the track here, as we saw before. A player may have a trait that will allow them to collect even more food. For example, if this species also had the foraging ability, 
then anytime this species eats plant food, you take one additional plant food from the same source. So in this case, after eating, we would get to take another one. However, you cannot take food if it would give the species more than its population. So in this case, the foraging ability would have no effect. So then the next player in clockwise order chooses one of their animals to feed, and then the next player goes, and so on, around and around the table until all of the animals have been fed, or once the food supply runs out, in which case there may still be some leftover hungry animals. It's also possible that you may completely feed your animals and the other players haven't yet, in which case you'll just sit out and wait until the rest of the players have continued feeding as much as they can. Everything I've described so far is how non-carnivores eat. And all animals are considered non-carnivores unless they specifically have been given the carnivore trait. So if it gets to your turn to feed and you have a carnivore, you can instead choose to eat with it. And it has slightly different rules. Let's take a look at that now. Carnivores will never eat plant food. Even if they have traits that say they could collect plant food, you'll just have to ignore those. Instead, they feed by attacking other species, hopefully ones controlled by your opponents. However, that may not be possible. They may not be valid targets, in which case you might have to attack one of the other species that you control. In other words, animals will always feed if there's an option to do so, even if that could end up being bad for you as a player. Carnivores can only attack a species if it has a body size larger than its target and the traits necessary to overcome any defensive traits the target may have. For example, if this species had the climbing trait, then the carnivore could not attack it unless it could also climb. And this is explained right here on the text of the ability. In this situation, we'll assume that the species can't climb, and that would make it a valid target. When a species is attacked, you reduce its population by one, and then take food from the bank equal to the body size of the animal attacked and give that to your carnivore. In this way, a carnivore feeding on a larger animal will fill itself up more quickly. This carnivore will continue to feed on future turns until it has food tokens equal to its population size or once it runs out of valid targets to attack. If it would ever gain more tokens than its population size, you just ignore those extras and don't collect them. If reducing your opponent's population causes the marker to go below the current amount of tokens they had on their board, they should add any excess tokens to their bag right now. Let's say the players continue taking turns and it comes back to this player again and they choose to have their carnivore attack this species once more. The population will be reduced by one. The carnivore will collect another token from the food bank. This token will be added to the player's bag but once a species population has gone below one, it is extinct, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Remember I said carnivores will never collect plant tokens, even if they have a trait that says they could. But non-carnivores, although they can never attack to gain meat, even if they're hungry, they're allowed to add meat to their board if they're gaining it through a trait that they have. After all the players have fed as much as they can, if a species did not fully eat, then reduce its population down to the amount that it did eat. This represents a portion of its population starving off. If the species did not eat at all, it goes extinct, which again, we'll look at shortly. After feeding, each player should take their own food bag and add to it any of the food tokens that their species collected. At the end of the game, each token is going to be worth one point. So you can see if your species have larger populations, you will be able to collect more tokens over the course of a round as long as there's tokens to collect. Otherwise, those species may starve. You will also leave any tokens on the watering hole that remain and to signal the end of the round, pass the first player marker clockwise to the next player. As mentioned, if a species population goes below one, then it becomes extinct, and we'll resolve that right now. First, you discard any trait cards it had assigned to it, but then draw up that number of traits back into your hand, which you'll be able to use in a later round. If the species went extinct by being attacked and has any food tokens on it, then the owner of this species 
will put those tokens into their bag and then remove the board from play. If it was between two other species, close the gap between them. The rounds will continue until during the deal cards phase, you run out of cards to deal. At that point, reshuffle the discard pile into a new draw deck and then deal out any cards that are required. That will be the last round of the game. If you go extinct and you're drawing cards to replace traits that you lost and then you run out of cards in the deck, reshuffle again and then the next round will be the final one. At the end of the game, players will add up their points to see who won. First, each player gains points equal to the total population size of all their surviving species. So this player would gain three points here and another one point here. You ignore the species body size. Then give yourself one point for every trait associated with your surviving species. So here we would get another three points. And then gain one point for every food token in your food bag. The player with the most points is the winner. If there's a tie, then the tied player who got the most points from their trait cards is the winner. And if there's still a tie, then the tied player who got the most points from their population size is the winner. And if there's still a tie, then you must order a pizza and play again. Because that's what the rules say. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and that's how you play Evolution. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.